Good day, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our Power Insights video series. Today, we're talking with Leslie Dewan, a nuclear engineer. Leslie is well known in the nuclear power industry. She's established companies such as Transatomic Power and Criticality Capital, and has been recognized by publications such as Time Magazine and Forbes, which have featured her as uh, one of the world's top energy innovators. She's previously participated in a power webcast about nuclear power, and today she joins us to discuss the technological advancements that will define the future of nuclear power generation. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you so much, Daryl. Really glad to be here. Uh, can you tell our audience about the work you're currently doing and discuss how you see the current state of nuclear power in both uh, the United States and worldwide? Sure. So I've recently started Criticality Capital, which is a venture capital firm and incubator where I'm focusing on investing in new nuclear technology and other types of clean energy generation. I started it because I think that now is one of the most exciting times to be working in nuclear. So the industry has just finally come out of decades of stagnation, and now there's a new generation of nuclear engineers who have developed these exceptionally innovative designs and are on the cusp of being able to build demonstration facilities. So it's, it's becoming real now after years and years and decades and decades of things seeming very intangible. So in terms of the overall technology, um, just to give a broader overview, you can divide it up into three categories. Um, so the most well-established one, which is in operation today, are better designs for large light water reactors. So these are reactors that use solid uranium oxide as fuel and have liquid water as coolant. So like the AP-1000 or the Korean APR-1400. You have lots of these that are currently operating around the world and many more that are under construction. And so these these are like big plants, typically gigawatt scale, um, basically the same reactors that we've always had, but with much better control and safety mechanisms, slightly higher fuel utilization as well. Then moving slightly further ahead, we have small modular reactors. So these have the same underlying technology like uranium oxide fuel, liquid water coolant, but they're much smaller and optimized for mass manufacture. So these are typically like 300 megawatts electric as compared to the gigawatt plus of large scale reactors. And this is useful because, you know, typically the grid doesn't need an additional gigawatt in one particular location. So bumping up with an additional 300, 400 megawatts electric in many cases gives you a much wider market. Um, and so the idea for these is that you can produce large numbers of them in a central location, mass manufacture them, and then ship them out. Um, What's especially exciting about this, so the U.S. company New Scale, uh, just on August 28th of this year, finally got their final approval from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for their design. So that shows the NRC's commitment to getting these designs to market. And then the final piece here, um, this is the one that's most interesting to me, and this has the potential to make the biggest positive impact, and these are advanced reactors. So these are designs that use different types of fuels and coolants. These are things like molten salt reactors, thorium reactors, uh, high temperature gas reactors are all part of this category. And this, uh, using these new types of materials basically opens up a much wider design space. Um, so you can have ultimately, more efficient operation, lower cost, uh, increased proliferation resistance, and make the system much more robust as well. Um, and in many cases also, these designs were initially developed in the very, very early days of the nuclear industry. So back in the 1950s and the 1960s, when there was this sense of like blue sky thinking about the design, people would try all sorts of crazy things. I mean, there was even one that used liquid plutonium as fuel, um, which, is, which is crazy. Um, but now people are looking at these designs with a fresh eye. So bringing in new types of materials advances that have occurred over the previous few decades, and most importantly, using modern computer simulations to optimize the design, refine the geometry, and making them much better. So ultimately, you're building a better nuclear future by learning from the past. And so right now on the technology side, just to wrap it up, so good reactors operating today, better ones that are on the horizon. So I'm feeling really optimistic about it. I know you're an expert on technology, which you just proved with your answer there. But uh, I, I know uh, you and I have in the past have discussed climate change and 
the role that nuclear power can play there, um, you know, with zero emissions. And, and obviously the concerns that people have about nuclear, which are, you know, certainly in my mind overblown. Uh, I, I am definitely a proponent of nuclear power and, and I know that you are too. Can you talk a little bit about how nuclear power, the, the role it can play in addressing global climate change? One thing that I think people don't realize is that nuclear right now already plays a really large role in carbon-free energy production. So right now, just over half of the U.S.'s carbon-free electricity comes from nuclear, from the conventional plants that are operating today. And I think in general, and this will be true for um, the plants that are coming down the line as well, the advanced reactors, nuclear complements renewables very well because nuclear generates baseload power. So it's just an always on constant source of electricity that goes well with the intermittent sources that are produced um, by renewables, by solar and wind in particular. And then one other area that is interesting and new is the development of some types of micro reactors. So these are reactors that would be producing between one and five megawatts electric, and they'd be exceptionally well suited to powering remote locations where the only alternative is very expensive and very polluting trucked in diesel fuel. And they also allow for a much more localized and resilient electric grid. Um, one other final piece here is that the, the tricky thing is that the new carbon-free technology, you know, whether it's new nuclear or solar or wind or anything else, that isn't going to solve the whole problem. So they're necessary, but they're not sufficient. So you have to think about the entire electric grid as a whole and also incorporate better forms of storage. So like grid scale batteries, pumped hydro storage so that you can properly match supply and demand. So I, another point that you and I have discussed in the past, uh, Russia and China and the roles that they've taken now in, in leading the export of their nuclear power technology. And uh, I know there are U.S. companies working on several projects. Obviously, you mentioned New Scale uh, and, and SMRs. What's needed in the U.S. to, uh, you know, bring our nuclear technology back to the forefront worldwide? Mm. I want to talk first about China, actually, because there's some okay. breathtaking things that are going on there. So they're putting enormous amounts of funding in China into building new types of nuclear reactors. So both the conventional designs and advanced reactors as well. Um, they have, I think, 12 new nuclear reactors under construction in China right now compared to just two in the U.S., and then another 40 planned and proposed. Um, and then in addition to that, they've also recently announced a 150 million billion, or sorry, $150 billion um, US plan to build another 30 nuclear reactors in other countries outside of China as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So they're, they're moving really fast. Um, and then in addition to that, they're putting billions of dollars into training young nuclear engineers in advanced nuclear reactor technology. So they have several hundred engineers in their program. Um, the average age, I think, is 28 years old. So it's, it's like a new Apollo program in some ways. Um, and so as, as a nuclear engineer, I think that's, you know, that's amazing. That's exactly what the world needs. And then as an American, I think, oh, this is, we need to step up our game a little bit. Um, but, but we are actually within the US, which is good. Um, we have a ways to go. But um, right now, the outlook for the US nuclear industry is substantially improved compared to where we were just a few years ago. And in particular, this is because of three very sensible, very bipartisan pieces of legislation that have been approved over the last few years. And these allow for things like um, uh, better collaborations among uh, private nuclear reactor companies and the national labs, making it more straightforward to test advanced reactor designs at national lab sites, and then furthermore directing the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission to establish a set of guidelines for licensing advanced reactors, so broadening their mandate to make sure that advanced reactors have a pathway right now. Um, and then in addition to that, there have been some very sensible funding programs within the U.S. at a variety of different scales. So 
I want to highlight two of them here. So one of them is the GAIN initiative. So the gateway for accelerated innovation in nuclear that allows for uh, very small nuclear companies um, to partner with US national labs and use the national labs expertise to work on their technology. And then most of the outputs of that work are then put into the public domain for everyone to use. So it greatly accelerates the nuclear research within the US. Um, and then in addition to that, there's uh, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, which is aiming to build two uh, advanced reactor demonstration units within the next five years, and then also put additional funding into um, accelerating the design of about five other advanced reactors as well. So I think those initiatives will help lift everyone up together. And, and one more thing before we close here, it, it, you touched on, you know, the funding, obviously people like Bill Gates are becoming involved in uh, supporting nuclear projects. Obviously, we need more people like Bill Gates doing that. Uh, what's your take on how to get uh, people like that involved in the nuclear power space? Hmm. I agree that there's immense need for more people to be involved in nuclear, more private funding in nuclear in addition to the public sector funding. And I think a lot of it just comes down to being able to make a solid business case for advanced nuclear. Advanced nuclear and other types of nuclear projects can't be relying on subsidies. We have to show that we can compete on a cost basis. And many of the designs are able to do that and they're able to focus on that. There, there's one additional piece actually that I think the nuclear industry needs. Um, so we can't solely focus on the new reactor designs at the exclusion of everything else. We have to work on building up the supply chain as a whole. So figuring out um, ways to manufacture at an industrial scale, the advanced materials that some of these reactors will need, or even things like um, just making the pumps and valves and heat exchangers at scale. Um, building up uh, better types of computer simulation software so we can do a lot of this on computers rather than by building test facilities, kind of shifting the labor that way. And then the last piece is training up a labor force. So China is building a lot of new nuclear reactors and therefore they have a lot of people who know how to pour the concrete and bend the rebar, do nuclear grade welding, and we're losing a lot of that expertise in the US. And that's something that I think we really need to focus on in the coming years. Okay, a lot more that we could talk about today, but uh, I think that's, that's good for now. We can uh, certainly follow up with you at some point in the future. I wanna thank Leslie for joining us today and providing her insight into how nuclear energy can shape the future of energy in both the US and worldwide. Thanks to our audience for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed this latest edition of Power Insights. Please join us for our next installment of our series as we interview power industry leaders and showcase the people and companies at the forefront of the evolving power generation landscape. Thanks again, Leslie, appreciate your time today. And uh, to our audience, have a great day.